I am known as a gap trader, uh, actually a gap fader. I'll explain the difference in a little bit. I've been doing this for over a decade. Um, it's my bread and butter. It's more than 90% of all the trading activity I've done for the past 12 years. Uh, it's a fantastic setup. I think it's the best opportunity to uh, trade the markets uh, with an edge and consistently um, for a small trader, at least retail trader, uh, extract profits. So I'm going to talk all about that. Again, this will not be a sales presentation whatsoever. So relax, um, kick your feet up, and uh, I'm going to share some good stuff with you. Let me know if you are not seeing my next slide here. Uh, it's a risk disclosure. I do have to cover this uh, because I'm going to be sharing some actionable research, meaning information that is uh, based on a very uh, detailed analysis and accurate analysis of uh, history for trading the opening gap. But um, as they like to say, uh, history is not a perfect predictor of the future. Never has been, never will be. In my mind, it is the best predictor of the future, however. But again, you want to use this information uh, real carefully um, uh, and at your own risk. Now, I'll also be talking a little bit about futures, though um, it's applicable to trading ETF stocks. Uh, I've tested a wide range of markets through the years, um, around the world actually. The concepts I'm going to share with you are absolutely applicable in basically any and every market I've ever tested. The one exception is I've never tested Forex. I know the prior speaker was talking about Forex. Um, I don't trade uh, foreign exchange. Uh, I've never tested it, and quite frankly, they're mostly 24-hour markets, so uh, there's not much of an opening gap to be traded, I guess, other than maybe that weekend gap. Um, but do use this information at your own risk. If you'd like a copy of these slides, um, you can go to vestaquant.com slash inspiration. Uh, you can copy the slides. Uh, again, I'm going to share a lot of research with you. I'll show you this link at the very end as well. Um, and uh, that's, this is the only thing I'm offering, by the way. So when I said this is not a sales presentation, I mean it. I believe there's way too much selling done in this industry and not enough education that's real. So um, I tend to do things a little bit differently. I don't follow all the classic rules on how you get people to spend as much money with you as they can. I just, I, I just don't believe that's what this industry needs. Um, so you won't hear that from me. But again, if you want to copy the slides, you can get a copy of the slides. You can get a free copy of um, my book. Uh, it's about a 60-page ebook. I have sold thousands of copies, actually over 5,000. Um, it is sold. There's no longer a print version available, um, but I do make the ebook available for free. If you're interested, you can go to the same link, investaquant.com slash inspiration. In fact, I'll post it here. I think you can uh, get uh, see it pop up in the chat box. Um, as we go along, I do welcome questions. Um, I will answer them if they're applicable to the slide that I'm on. There are no unfair questions. I believe in answering any and all questions. I don't skip questions. I will repeat them for the audience. I'm not sure if you guys can see them or not. Um, uh, but please feel free to fire away, and uh, we should have some time at the end uh, to get to any questions that I don't answer along the way. So here's what I'm going to be covering over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to show you the only thing that matters on my resume. I will talk a little bit about my background very briefly just so you understand where I'm coming from and any biases I may have. I'm going to help you understand the basics of fading the gap. There are different ways to trade opening gaps. I uh, primarily fade the gap, and I'll talk all about that. I think it's a fantastic setup. It is a fantastic setup. Uh, I have hundreds of clients around the world that pay me to access my research um, and trade the exact same setup. Um, I'll go into that research, the basics, uh, at a very high level. I'll share some uh, accurate and updated research. Um, there's more of it in the book if you want to download it again, um, or download it at investorquant.com slash inspiration. But um, I'll be talking how to put the pieces together. It's easy to get overwhelmed trading. Uh, a lot of people like to say, oh, you need to make trading simple. Uh, keep it simple. If it's complicated, it won't work. Well, I hate to tell you, but if you keep it too simple, that's not going to work either. So you're really trying to find a balancing act. And I've, I've gone from the very simple to the very complex over the years, and I think I've got it balanced out uh, now finally. But, and I'll share that logic with you and how I approach um, analyzing up and deciding which ones to trade and which ones I'm not going to trade. I'm actually going to show you my own historical results here in just a few minutes, uh, answer any and all of your questions, and um, show you how you can learn more. So again, kick back, relax. 
There is no opportunity to buy anything today, so I will not be trying to sell you anything, okay? Just relax. Um, open your brain, and uh, let's get to it. So uh, I was fortunate enough as a fairly young guy, I was uh, about 35, to take a company public uh, back in 1999 at the height of the dot-com bubble, and I got to witness a volatile small cap stock moving up and down and all around day in and day out for years as I uh, ran the company. And um, uh, I stepped down as CEO after about three years and uh, had a little time and a little money to figure out what I wanted to do next in my life and um, decided I wanted to become a trader. So I enrolled with a the best mentor I could find, I won't name him, uh, but I learned how to options trade using discretionary trading techniques, chart trading basically, chart or price-based trading using only indicators. It was fascinating, the guy was, was and is an absolute guru, uh, real deal, tremendous trader, and I am a fairly disciplined individual, having been to West Point, and um, I paid close attention to everything he said. I took copious notes. He even had a very detailed manual. said, if you do everything like this, you will be wildly successful and achieve returns similar to me. And I did that, and he was right for about 12 months. I actually made six figures on a six-figure account my first year. And, of course, it did like any prudent person would do at the end of a first year. Uh, I doubled my position size because I'd proven the methodology, and more importantly, I'd proven that I was a very good trader. So I thought. I then proceeded as the market turned sideways. If you go back and look at the charts, I think it was like 2004, 2003, I was doing primarily a, a long-only um, call strategy options, and uh, market turned sideways 2004, and that was the end of my great run. And worse, um, I started giving back my gains that I'd made in the prior year and basically gave um, all but the last 2% back. I refused to go negative in my account, uh, but that was in less than three months of the second year, and it was uh, pretty devastating, quite frankly. Uh, the key thing I learned without belaboring the story is, at least for me, and I believe most frankly, um, using charts and indicators as your primary technique is a flawed approach. Yes, some people can do it, but it takes decades to learn how to master the interpretation of charts through a wide range of market conditions. Uh, and what works in one given market condition or environment won't work most of the time in another market environment. So the key uh, for me was to f quantify my strategy so I knew what a reasonable expectation was for the current market conditions. If it was a raging bull market or a raging bear market, I knew that my different strategies and techniques would have different historical performances. And that was an eye-opening experience for me and really made all the difference for me, uh, point blank. So um, I've been uh, very successful over the years. I focused on the opening gap uh, because it occurs so frequently. I'll get into that in a moment. I've trained thousands. I've certainly trained um, hundreds personally. Um, thousands in environments like this, and not tens of thousands. Um, I do have a decent kitchen, a vacation in expensive places, and yes, my mother does think I'm handsome. So of course, that makes me eminently qualified to train you, right? Um, I think most of you would say, yeah, that's a credible background, credible bio, I'm willing to listen here, Scott. And I would argue that you are absolutely incorrect, okay? Um, nothing in my background that I just told you, other than I, you know, I made some mistakes, and well, I didn't really make too many mistakes. I just, uh, I learned a lot from my first 15 months of trading that I explained to you. Uh, but even that doesn't necessarily make me someone that you should listen to, because it's easy to not make money uh, in the markets. It's easy to, not easy, but um, I should say, it's easy to overestimate someone's credibility and their ability to teach you simply based upon their degree. There's no advanced degree, there's no amount of intelligence uh, in the world that will make someone capable of teaching you how to trade the markets and make money consistently. Okay? Um, a lot of people would lead you to believe that, but it's absolutely not true. Um, this is not, you have to have a certain minimum level of intelligence, but just being here, I'm sure all of you qualify. This is not about degrees. This is not about intelligence, okay? This is not about having experience in losing money. There's only one thing that matters, and only one. 
matters whether or not I know how to make money in the markets. And any educator you listen to, if they won't show you this, won't prove to you that they've made money consistently, not just over a few months, over a few years even, even the few years would start becoming credible. But certainly a year or two is not enough to prove much to anyone, certainly not to me. Then you need to be real careful because um, any given strategy will work in a given year or two. So that could make anyone a perceived expert. And that's what goes on all the time in this industry. So um, this is not the pretty equity curve. I'm not claiming it at all. I'm the best trader by any means, okay? I've learned a lot. I'm getting better at th as I think you can see from my equity curve over here. Um, let's see if I've got, I'm trying to see if I can have a, see if you can see my mouse more easily. I won't worry about it, but hopefully you can see my mouse over here. Um, you know, I've had my share of um, drawdowns. If you're not familiar with the term drawdown, a lot of educators don't like to talk about them, but it's absolutely the most important state of one's uh, trading that you need to master, and that is when you are trading below a prior high and the dollar value of your trading account. It's called a drawdown. So these are all drawdowns. Anytime the price or my equity in my account went down, those were all drawdowns. If you add them up, there's at least 20 of these things um, of varying degrees over the years that I have endured and ultimately prospered. Okay, So um, this is absolute paramount that you learn how to master trading and that you listen and give emphasis to folks that have actually been through these drawdowns that know how to manage the psychological component, that know that they have an edge and can prove that they have an edge. Okay? Yeah. Everybody with me so far? I know I went on a little bit of a rant there, but I'm very passionate about this. Okay? So I really want to help and um, it's important that you focus on the right considerations. Now, um, what I'm, the next slide is not as important because this, by the way, just to be clear, is over 2,000 trades. Um, TradeStation has been my primary broker. I've placed virtually all of my trades, and my uh, trading career has been with them. It's over 95%. I do have a couple of smaller brokerage accounts uh, that I maintain for kids and so on. But um, this is every account I've got. I've obviously um, covered up my uh, brokerage number or my account number there. It's over 2,000 trades. Now, this next slide is not as important, but it's worthy of consideration. This is my year-to-date results because there have been times when I start off the year and I wasn't successful, um, and that wouldn't necessarily make me a bad trader or someone that you shouldn't listen to, right? So, uh, but uh, this is sort of the my ideal kind of market environment that we're in right now: choppy, volatile. We've had some um, bearishness, right? Some current concerns of the market, and that we've rallied and recovered most of it. Uh, so I maintain a account, one account, the second one here that is shown, that is my, it's actually an IRA account, and I'm trading futures in it, just as a side note, uh, with about $100,000 in it. And I trade um, eight different but similar gap strategies uh, in this account. And I'm only trading one contract. Um, and one contract is probably, in a relative sense of risk, equivalent to trading... Um, Depends on how you want to do the math on it, but say uh, twenty thousand or fifty thousand dollars, probably in like the spider. Technically, probably a hundred thousand. <throat> and I see a couple of the comments. Um, what's uh, yeah? This is a hundred thousand dollar account. This is trading one contract on each of eight different individual gap strategies. They're related. I could have traded. Um, eight contracts, if you will, in one strategy, but I get a little bit of diversification by trading different ones, and I call it my tracking account. I use it for tracking results, the strategies that we make available to our clients. Um, I believe in eating my own thing. Um, so I'm going to get in a comment about, we're only going to see 45 minutes of promotional information by the speaker. Nope. I'm trying to lay the groundwork so that you will understand that uh, what I'm about to share with you is real and works. I'm going to get into it right now. So let's get into the basics. So what is a gap? There are several different definitions of an opening gap. The difference is um, between the securities opening price, so 
wherever it opens in a given day for the New York Stock Exchange, that would be 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time, and the prior day's closing price. If you're trading an ETF like the Spider, that would be 4 o'clock uh, Eastern or 4.15 if you're trading the futures. And the difference shows a visually on a price chart is a vertical space or a gap. Hence, that's the opening gap. Here's an example. Uh, these are five-minute candlesticks on a choppy day, but this prior day closed at 4.15 in the futures, up at 19.78 from this example, and then the next morning it opened up at 9.30, down considerably. It looks like about a seven or eight-point gap. And though it chopped around quite a bit, was pretty choppy, ultimately price action made it all the way back to the prior day's close, uh, thereby filling the gap. So that's an opening gap. Now, a lot of folks think the way to trade gaps is to follow them. Some people call it going with the gap. Um, I call it following the gap if you want to do that. Uh, that works better. That's a, a valid technique for swing traders entering trends, especially if they're breaking out from big consolidation patterns. Um, maybe a momentum stock like a biotech. Uh, that's been a fantastic technique for getting into trades. But that's not the easy money. The easy money is actually fading the opening gap. And what I mean by fade is that you go the opposite direction of the morning or prevailing market um, condition. So if the morning's gap is uh, going up in price action in the pre-market, if you watch futures or some of the uh, pre-market activity in the ETFs or individual stocks, and you see that the price is higher than its prior day closing price, then I would short it if it met my criteria. Vice versa, if it were below, then I would buy it. So that would be called fading the opening gap. Does that make sense? If that does not make sense, please speak up now. I'm happy to clarify further. Uh, I'll show you an example, um, actually, I think on this next slide. And I'm generally targeting the prior day's close. Sometimes I'll go beyond the prior day close. It's called an extended target when conditions are um, optimal. And again, if you're trading an ETF like the Spider, you would use the 4 p.m. closing price from the prior day. For the futures, I use 4.15. And if neither my target nor my stop is hit, then I close it at the end of the day. Okay, so I close the very end of the day, which would be 4 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, question, uh, can I confirm um, or clarify fading? Um, sure. Let me go to show you an example. And a Spider is the ETF, the SPY. Sorry about that, Eric. SPY is uh, the, probably the world's largest and most frequently traded um, ETF, certainly one of them. It represents the S&P 500. I trade the S&P 500 futures, arguably the most important um, index and market in the world because it's just such a macro uh, representation of, of the global economy, not just the U.S. economy, but also the, um, uh, the global economy. S&P futures is the ES, that is correct. Another question, um, sorry, RJ, uh, NinjaTrade allows you to trade futures within your IRA. You know, I don't know. I'm using, we do offer um, NinjaTrader services here. I don't have an account with NinjaTrader. Um, you generally have to, in order to trade your IRA within a brokerage, you ought to talk to them. Uh, get it set up in a trust, like uh, Millennium. There's a couple of them. I use Millennium, um, and they're fine. It's just a little bit of paperwork, and then they will set up an account for you. It's really pretty seamless. It's in the broker's um, interest to help you. Okay, so here's an example. Um, so prior day closed around that 1854 level. We had a big gap down on this particular chart, and then it rallied to fill the gap before pulling back sideways. So a fade means to, again, trade in the opposite direction of the gap. Gap is down, you buy it. Gap is up. You short it. And again, these are five minute charts. This is an intraday action. You can see the timeline down here. Everybody clear? Because really important, I'm going to show you a bunch of research now that is based on fading the opening gap. If it's not clear, you need to tell me now. All right. All right. Thanks, Cindy. So, uh, why do they work? Well, you've got a number of events that can occur in the overnight session. Overnight session being anywhere between 4.15 Eastern Time and 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. In fact, the majority of the time, the regular session is not in effect. You're dealing with what they call blowbacks. 
or overnight as I call it for short, and you've got any number of events, right? You can have economic news out of China or somewhere in Europe. Uh, you can have geopolitical events. Any number of things can cause the market to gap up or down overnight. And what we mean by gap is the futures are actually trading. They're not really gapping. They're moving beyond um, either up or down from the prior day closing price. So <clears throat> it's that opportunity. It's normally on light volume. Um, it's that movement that creates an opportunity to actually trade in the opposite direction. 90% of the time, that opening gap, that movement overnight is big enough to trade, and the overwhelming majority, 65 to 70% of all opening gaps will fill the same day. What I mean by that, they will retrace back to the prior day's close. And all you're really doing is taking advantage of the, the news-driven traders, right? You can have legitimate news that causes a market to gap. Let's say it's a monthly jobs report. Let's say it's really good, supportive, um, uh, news for the markets, and you'll have big money that'll come in because they're they're longer time frame buyers, and it's legit, and they're not worried about a few points in the ES or um, a few dollars um, even in the spider. They will jump in even if it's a big gap. But the big money in general doesn't like to do that. The big money in general is going to they don't want to pay retail prices, so they're going to try to drive prices back to the prior day's close. Um, and that's the move, that's the fade move that I'm essentially piggybacking on. Um, and when I'm entering, there's a question, am I buying or selling at market? Yes, I'm using, I actually use a market order. A lot of people find that hard to believe. Uh, I've used it for years. Yes, occasionally you have some slippage, but it is not nearly as much as you think, for one, because you're going the opposite direction of the prevailing morning move. And two, the cost of that slippage, maybe you'll get a tick in the ES. Um, on average at most, in fact half the time I get no slippage, um, but when you do get slippage, that cost is more than compensates for the risk of missing out on a really good setup. So let's look at win rates. I told you it was 65 to 70 percent. You look back the past 10 years, you can see the actual number of what I call tradable gaps. This excludes the very smallest gaps that are generally say a point, point and a half in the ES or 10 or 15 cents in the spider. Um, I've got, a, little, I've got a, a formula that I use to determine that. It's basically a percentage of the five-day average true range and a percentage of the value of the index that I pay attention to. Uh, it doesn't matter. It comes out to about a point, point and a half in the ES on average. Um, and you can see the win rates. Remarkably consistent over the years. Some years a little bit better, some years a little bit worse. But bottom line is seven out of ten times that gap is going to fill the same day, which makes it, in my mind, the only setup I know that truly has an inherent bias and a logic for making it work. <clears throat> Question, would you buy or sell the open always or where is the entry? Personally, uh, Gerhard, I enter at the open. I don't want to miss my best setups. I do tons of analysis to make sure I'm trading on the right side of history, meaning that there's a clear historical edge, and then I'm entering at the open. Now, that said, a friend of mine, some of you have probably heard of him, Mark Chaikin. He befriended me years ago, after, actually after I wrote my small book on gaps, and uh, he picked up the phone and called me. We talked about gaps and became friends. He told me uh, we did very similar approaches to trading the gap. The difference was he always entered five minutes after the open five minutes after the open because he liked to evaluate the price action in the five minutes after the open. And that made sense. And he had a little bit higher win rate than I did. But when we deter we crudely compared our notes um, in terms of profitability, we made about the same amount of money because I caught the easiest gap trade wins, the ones I didn't want to miss. He would miss the easy ones, the one that started working for you. Or he would cost him some money because they'd start filling and he would miss out. So you can enter whenever you want. I've got clients that enter at a wide range of times, but most people I would say are plus or minus minutes of the open. Um, I don't know if this works on Forex. There's not much of a gap in Forex other than that weekend gap, Dion, so um, I, I just don't know. It's the one market I haven't tested. Um, I'll talk about stops in just a moment. Uh, I've got a couple of slides on that, and I don't recommend brokers. Um, as I mentioned before, I've had done most of my trading with uh, TradeStation. We have a number of clients that use Interactive Brokers, NinjaTrader, uh, Thinkorswim, um, from TD Ameritrade are some of the more common ones. Uh, they've all got the problems, and they're all generally pretty good. That's the good news. All right, so stops and targets. Let's talk tar uh, targets first. So a couple of interesting points. First, let me make sure, orient you, make sure you understand the graph here. 
target is a percent of gap size. So all I'm doing is saying, let's say you're trading a dollar size gap in the spider. That's a deep, pretty reasonable size gap. Normally equates to about 10 points in the ES. This shows the odds of it trading or filling at least 25% of the way, or 25 cents in the spider, or two and a half points in the ES. 87% of all 2,000 gaps over the past 10 years or so that were tradable have filled at least 25% of the way. 78% have filled 50%. 68% have filled 100% of the time. Now, a lot of educators like to talk about how they take profits at the midpoint of gap fill, and that's fine, good for them, but they're leaving a ton of money on the table, and uh, they're teaching people the wrong way to do it, in my opinion, and the reason is real simple. The math is overwhelmingly and compellingly supportive of holding, frankly, all of your position from a pure profit expectancy point of view for full gap fill because you're not giving much up much in win rate. Eighty-five percent of those that fill halfway will go on and fill all the way. So for a small degradation in win rate, you double your average win size. Does that make sense? You're doubling your average win size while only giving up a little bit in win rate. And when you do the math on profit expectancy, which is the odds of a winner times the size of your average win, minus the odds of a loss times the size of your average loss, the math overwhelmingly favors uh, targeting gap fill. I'm using five-minute tick charts. Oh, correction, five-minute tick charts. I'm not using tick charts anymore. I've, I've dabbled with them over the years. I'm using a, a simple five-minute chart um, is what I watch, but frankly, you don't even need charts to trade the way I trade. I routinely trade from vacation or traveling uh, from my phone without even looking at a chart. I just need to know where the price is and where we closed and what my research shows for the day. Um, this research I'm showing um, not only works for the, the indices, the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the Russell, the, their numbers, because they're so correlated, are very similar to the numbers you see here. But uh, the numbers are also very similar in most stocks. The exceptions are momentum stocks uh, or early stage stocks that may be going through a lot of growth um, or may have recently IPO'd because um, they're, they're going to do their own thing. They tend to be um, impacted by outside forces. So any stock or equity that is correlated fairly well correlated with the indices, is, uh, this data is going to be very applicable. It's actually going to be very similar. Um, and all these um, uh, statistics are shown based on the E-mini S&P 500. Um, I've run them all, of course, on the Spider and the NASDAQ and the Dow and the Russell and the DAX and the FTSE and so on, and the numbers are very, very similar. Um, you can certainly, you certainly ought to verify on your own if you want. I've published research over the years in my blog and elsewhere uh, showing that, but uh, I assure you the numbers are very similar. Uh, yeah, one of the interesting points is someone's asking about what about the extended targets down here. What this also shows you is holding for a little bit more, an extra 25% of the size of the gap, you only lose 4%. Look at that. Your win rate really barely moves, yet you cap capture quite a bit more in profits, 25% more. That, over time, adds up a lot. So, um, and the, again, if you hold for even bigger ones, the win rate goes down even further. Let me continue. I've got 20 minutes left here, and I've got more, a lot more research. <clears throat> One other question, which index do you like best? I love the S&P futures, the ES. Um, I think it's... Uh, I think it's the most liquid uh, market, um, at least in the futures world. Um, it's clean, it's liquid, it's efficient. Um, futures give you tax benefits where they're treated 60% long-term gain versus 40% short-term, which is a fantastic tax advantage. You only have to know one item, your net profit or loss for the year on, on uh, futures trades when you do your accounting for taxes, which I just did, versus having to account for every individual trade. It's just the, the advantages are just off the chart. In my biased opinion, but I've been doing this a long time and most of my clients have come to the same conclusion. So what about stop size? Um, so a lot of people say, well, that's great. All I've got to do is get the right stop and I can make tons of money, right? Well, not so fast, unfortunately. Um, you got to have one, but they're really overrated uh, big time. And this is using S&P 500 points. Um, I'm using a percent of gap size here for this table. and which was similar to that prior chart, and then a percentage of the five-day average true range. That's just, true range is the difference between the high and the low of a given day, inclusive of any un 
Newton filled gap if there were, uh, was one averaged over five days. Um, that's more of a volatility adjusted one. It's my favorite one, but again, it doesn't change the overall profitability. Uh, your win rate, the bigger your stop, is directly correlated. Uh, the higher the win rate, but you don't make any more money. Right? The bigger the stop, the bigger your win rate. The bigger stop, the bigger the win rate. doesn't matter what technique you use because um, it's unfortunately the inverse of that is a uh, there's an inverse correlation with win-loss ratio, which results in your profitability being basically zero. Profit factor, by the way, is a ratio of historical profits to historical losses. Historical profits for all the winners divided by historical losses from all your losers. So anything around one is dead break even historically. No edge. That's the key thing here. There's no edge. Um, high win rate, but no edge. So how in the world do you possibly make money trading gaps? Selection. Selection is the key here. Just like I said, stops, you know, I use stops to basically back into the win rate I want my strategy to achieve. And I personally, with my personality, I tend to be fairly passionate and pretty intense and I like to feel like a winner, right? I think most people do. I need to have a high win rate strategy. I have a hard time dealing with strategies that have less than 50% win rates, even less than 60%, because mathematically the odds are over a series of, say, 100 trades, I'm going to encounter, or you're going to encounter, seven, eight, nine losers in a row if you're trading a strategy that only has a 50-50 win rate. At some point in that 100 trade stretch, you'll have seven, eight, nine losers in a row. And that means what you'll probably do is either skip on the next trade or start tweaking your targets, tweaking your stops, and modifying your strategy. And next thing you know, you've blown it on the biggest winner you would have had that month or quarter or maybe even the year. Uh, and you, it gets in your head and your situation gets worse and it just goofs you up, uh, for lack of better terms. It, it does. This is an incredibly um, intense psychological game. And for me, the best thing to do is just to leave everything alone. Pick a high win rate, pick a stop and use a stop that gives me a high win rate, which means I generally risk a little bit more than I stand to make. But that's okay because um, my win rate, as long as my win rate's high enough, I can still make good money, and that's what I've done over the years. And again, most of the time, I target prior close, and I use extended targets sometimes. But the key here is this is what your takeaway needs to be. The name of the game with gap trading is not wasting your time trying to figure out where to place your stop on today's trade. The name of the game is figuring out which ones have clear biases towards filling that day and then trade them all the same. That's my belief from staring at charts and doing thousands of hours of research over the past decade plus. Uh, Byron says the future is already down before the gap, already known before the gap. Um, not sure exactly what you're asking, but yes, I watch the futures in the pre-market, um, and I can see how the gaps are setting up in the ETFs in the various stocks as well. That gives me an idea because it's all highly, highly correlated. Spider, the SPY ETF, and the ES are like 95, 96 percent correlated. Okay, so how do you select gap trades? Well, one, gap size is an easy one to use to get you on the right side of history. And what this table here shows is if you look at um, gap size relative to the five-day average true range, so again, as volatility expands, the number gets bigger. As volatility contracts, you get smaller. And so gap size relative to the recent uh, volatility is a very good way to measure it, in my opinion. And this shows you basically Anything less than 40% of the five-day ATR has either break e is break-even or profitable historically with very high win rates. So this really checks both blocks for me. It keeps my win rate high and uh, my profitability is up. Now, this doesn't mean that I won't trade a bigger gap. I trade bigger gaps, um, I wouldn't say all the time, but frequently. It all depends on uh, the state of the market at the time. Some giant gaps are very profitable in the right conditions, and most of the time, though, they're better off left alone. So this is a simple one. If you're looking for a simple way to get started, an actionable takeaway tomorrow, don't trade or don't fade gaps if they're bigger than 40%. That's a simple rule to get started with. And um, 
just reiterating um, how I'm entering or um, after I've, and I'm telling you how to select the gap trades right now, but once I make a decision to trade, uh, I see the gaps evolving and unfolding like they did this morning. They were down early morning, they filled the gap, and then they opened up, um, and then it melted back and opened flat. 90% um, of the time, I'm entering right at the open. In fact, every trade up, the trades I showed you in my equity curve earlier this year, those are all um, entered precisely at the open. I have no variance and no discretion. From time to time, if I see a really good setup and the data is really good, um, I will maybe scale into the position just to make sure I capture a little bit of the gap. Sometimes the really good ones will melt away, uh, but that's been going on for years and that will never change. So I wait till 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time Open. Okay, zone. This one I will warn you can get a little bit confusing, so I want to take my time and make sure that you're tracking with me. Um, Gap zone is a fantastic selection criteria. Oh, by the way, if you're just joining us or missed the beginning of this, you can download these slides at uh, investorquant.com slash inspiration because I have a lot of data. I know some of you are furiously um, typing notes right now. Just go there and you can download the slides. Investorquant forward slash inspiration. So zone, by zone what I mean is I'm looking at where a market is trading at its open. So today, you look at where today we opened relative to where we closed the prior day. Now this looks similar to yes, um, yeah, yesterday's uh, candlestick, right? We had the green candlestick, the gap up, right? It closes the thick blue line here. And today we had a really tiny gap. It actually opened though right in the right at the close, but it was trading a little bit there in the UHC zone. This is just my own personal nomenclature. Some people like to use it, some people find it confusing. It's efficient for me to name the zones. So there are five potential zones based on a prior day up candlestick. We can open above the prior day high, which we did not do, though it looked like we might today. We can open between the high and the close, between the close and the open in between the open and the low or below the low. Five different opening zones if the prior day candlestick was green. Um, I'm getting a comment, there's no picture. Can you guys still see my screen? I can see my screen, but that won't do you any good. Okay, good, thank you. So, um, does that make sense? And it's okay if it's if it doesn't, but you can see the historical win rate based on simply the opening zone, and the highest probability is the UHC zone and the UCO zone. Um, and these were the zones that were really um, in play today. In fact, let me go to the next slide. I'll try to add a little bit more clarity if anyone's still confused. If the prior day closes with a red candlestick, the high. Uh, open, close, and low, those four levels once again create five more zones. I just call these D base zones because the D, the prior day was down. It closed below the low, it's open. And you still use the open, high, low, close nomenclature. And you can see how the odds generally favor the smaller gaps around the prior close. Those are the, these are the ones that I've circled that I like to trade the most. Uh, the ones that I've circled in red are the ones, I never say never because again, market conditions rule. Um, but almost never will I trade a DH zone gap or a UL zone gap. Almost never. Just too risky. Um, and I'm sorry, this is a daily candlestick you're looking at here, uh, Gat. Daily candlestick. So we're looking at um, a daily chart. And then the next morning, we look to see where we're opening. So uh, third consideration, I call it seasonality or calendar considerations. And this is a simple one, but I use it, and it's um, highly effective and certainly risky to not consider day of the week. Uh, looking back at my research over the past 10 years, Mondays through Fridays, total win percent varies. Uh, it generally starts off low and gets higher as the week goes on. Uh, the markets have had a bit bit of a long bias for the past 10 years, so this is a little bit influenced by that for sure. Um, so you always want to be careful if you're looking at a real, you know, just a singular 
concept like this without considering the market condition, but in general, down gaps have been very effective in the middle of the week, and the most dangerous gaps have been shorting up gaps at the beginning of the week. So be careful shorting up gaps. Um, be more confident buying down gaps. And I've been trading a long time, and even when the market was not as bullish, this was generally true as well. So the key here on making this information even more valuable for you beyond the gap size, the gap zone, and the day of the week is to consider those exact same concepts for similar market conditions. Similar market conditions. They won't behave the same. These stats don't hold up, or I should say better, they vary. This is the average, so they hold up. I mean, they're real, but they vary based on market conditions. There are times I will absolutely shorten up gap on a Monday. There are times I wouldn't touch a down gap on a Wednesday with a 10-foot pole. Same with uh, zone. Right? The good is not always good, and the bad is not always bad. Um, these are single, high-level filter that I found extremely helpful and the, the core of what I've done for over a decade for evaluating gaps and they're still the foundation of everything I do and of the results I showed you year to date um, at the beginning of uh, today's webinar. But the key is to make sure you consider them in the context context of the um, current market conditions. So a lot of ways to evaluate market conditions. I'm not a, at all here to tell you that these are the best or the only ways to evaluate them. These are the ones we use, that I use personally, and that uh, I make available um, uh, to uh, our clients. Uh, with a basic idea, you can see the difference in them. Trend is really proximity to recent highs or lows. That's the way I like to determine trend. Momentum is really the persistency of the recent movement. Um, over different time frames. Volatility, you know, we've been expanding or contracting um, or a little bit of both lately. Uh, where are we relative to uh, like um, uh, the mean, like a 20-day mean, think your bands here, right, based around 20-period mean. Are we overbought? Are we oversold? Are we stretched, you know, in a relative sense? And then again, as I mentioned, day of week and uh, I like to consider day of week and part of month um, in any directional bias uh, leading into that uh, calendar consideration. So each of these criteria to the left has a range. So I, we evaluate, I evaluate, uh, this is how I do it. I take the my system, I have a trend system, a momentum system, a volatility system, I ever bought, ever sold, and seasonality. And I know this sounds complicated, it's really simple conceptually though. Um, I take the trend system and I slice it into different degrees of trendiness, and from bullishness to bearishness, and vice versa for momentum, strong momentum to no momentum, volatility, high volatility to low volatility. And then I take those different states of these concepts, and I evaluate gap size and gap zone for that current state, for where we are today for the current market conditions. Does that make sense? Because that is it. Understand, and I'm happy to repeat it. If you don't get that, you're really missing out on a hugely valuable nugget, if you will, on, on how to be a better trader. And that is to not focus at the first level of a concept, which like gap size or some of these simple things a lot of educators throw around, but to look at that concept in the context of current conditions. So Rick says, do I understand this correctly? You are stacking the odds of all the different stats you're sharing to come up with one confluence-like signal to enter trade. Exactly, Rick. That's exactly right. I look at all of the different considerations, the most important being gap size and gap zone, in the context of these five different market states, uh, which are evaluated. I like to use the past 10 years, a 10-year window. And if it shows it's a good setup, then I know historically with great confidence that I'm trading something that historically the markets are set up in such a way that has favored me making money. And I know it with extreme confidence because I've got five systems that have confirmed that. We're around two different core concepts here, the gap size and the gap zone. Do you think I have a trouble pulling the trigger? Nope. Do you think I'm overly upset if I have a loss? Nope. 
though I'll admit I'll never get used to losses, but I'm wrong one-third of the time. One-third of the time, I'm still not able to be successful. Normally, I'm, I get stopped out before it rolls over um, if that happens. But I'm not trying to be right. I'm trying to make money. And for me, the, about two times out of three is the right win rate for me. Um, and then I've got, I'm using TradeStation, but lots of brokerages have 10 years of data. Um, and you don't need to have, a, you can download it. I actually start off by downloading historical data from Yahoo Finance originally. Let me continue. We're, I'm almost at the end of my time. Um, and let me give you an example. There's a request for an example. So um, here's an example of the importance of knowing the current market condition or the context of a given, given filter. So let's say we had a large up gap today. We didn't, but we've had a number of them. We had one what, um, yesterday, a large up gap. The historical win rate when following a 10-day high, right? 10-day high is a simple way to express um, trend, right? Trend is clearly up if you're up near a 10-day high. Well, the historical win rate for fading, that would be shorting large up gaps. And this is going back 15 years here. And I defined large as that 40% level, 40% of the five-day average true range I've talked about previously. 55% win rate. That doesn't sound overly impressive until you realize that, wow, it's made 30% more profits and losses. That's roughly what a 1.3 profit factor means. Is that a solid trade? Sure. But what if you have that exact same large up gap, same exact size, see a 10-point gap in the ES or a dollar in the spider? but you were coming on the heels of a 10-day low. The new trader, inexperienced trader, uninformed trader would think that that was just as good of a setup. Hey, large up gaps, they're good to fade because it's a cool concept. Big money likes to push price action back to the prior close. For all those reasons I told you that gaps occur, you're thinking I'm riding the, the coattails of big money. Well, no, you're not. Big money's, they're covering their shorts. They're buying on the open. That's why you don't fade them. That's a bad setup. So exact same consideration, large up gap, but two different market states give dramatically different results. Dramatically different results. And again, you can get a copy of these slides at InvestorQuant slash inspiration. I'll show you that in a moment. So here's an example for today. We had a small up gap. Um, we opened in the ES. Now this is a busy eye chart from 2070. We opened um, actually right above the prior close. We didn't have much of a gap and I couldn't trade it, but we were trading in the zone and I was going to short today's gaps. If it had opened above my minimum gap amount, which today was 1.6 points, all eight systems. I was all eight strategies were firing and I would be all in. And by the way, I've traded manually um, all of my trading strategies for probably 90% of my trading strategies for the past 12 years. I am um, recently I've become automated. It saves me a lot of time and makes it a lot easier to execute um, and turn my capital. But this was a fantastic setup for a small gap up today. 70% historical win rate on five different systems. So this is what it looks like. That's just my database. The same concepts I'm showing you I've put in a database and made available and published each evening so I'm prepared the next morning and my clients are prepared. Again, I'm not going to talk about InvestorQuant today. I'll show you how you can learn more if you're interested. Uh, I promise you education, so let's stick with that. So bottom line is I look at a lot of different considerations when I try to pick my gaps, but it's all in the context of similar market conditions, trend, momentum, overbought, oversold, um, seasonality. Okay? So that's what I mean. That concept is called ensemble forecasting. It's a very robust way to analyze data. In fact, it's done in most uh, markets. Hey, Scott, don't mean to interrupt, but we just are about out of time. Okay. I think I'm on my last slide here, actually. Uh, next to last. So next up is execution. You want to learn more about how uh, what I just shared today and how I actually execute these trades. Uh, go to the same place to download the slides and the book. And uh, you can get it all done with just um, on that one page, investorquant.com slash inspiration. And I've got a webinar next Wednesday where I'll go into greater detail. A uh, couple quick questions. Do you use options to trade the gap? I don't. I trade the futures primarily, though we do have some clients that do. Uh, if you were going to trade it, yes, weeklies is what a lot of our, our clients are using. Is there a source for the ATR? Do you figure it yourself? Um, I just calculate it uh, ourselves um, off our data feed. It's easy enough. Most brokerages um, enable an ATR-based calculation. Folks, I'm sorry. I got a little long-winded there. Um, if you have questions, you can email me, scott at investorquant.com. 